And uh, I think we can start the, the session. So the first of all, uh, I wanted to say thank you. We have, we have uh, Professor Gattinoni, which is based in Germany. We have Dr. Camporota, which is based in, in the UK. And we will have later on a uh, Professor Cumelo, which is, or Cumelo, you pronounce, is based in, in Italy. So we'll have the first of these two uh, webinars today, which we hope are going to be quite useful for our, our people and our audience in, in acute respiratory management. And, um, and um, yeah, thank you very much for joining us. And, um, I think I will give the room now to Professor Gattinoni. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to everybody. Thank you for the invitation to speak at this webinar. And thank you also for the topic, which is RDS, pathophysiology and different phenotypes. Well, I think that in our treatment, the pathophysiology, admit for me, is the basis. Uh, I don't trust too much uh, protocols or big numbers and all. I would like to understand which are the mechanisms operating in a given patient in a given time, because I think the patient has to be, the treatment has to be tailored in this situation. Mm -hmm. And let's see, let's start with what we call RDS. Since 1967, that means more than 50 years you know, in my life, I had the privilege to know, I think most, if not all the people who contribute to our understanding, treatment and uh, of LDS, including Patty. He was one of the scribes, the LDS in 67. And LDS is a sort of word of communication. When I say LDS, everybody intends a white uh, radiography, the patient on the ventilator, some people, some need of oxygen, a tube in the throat. But the RDS is a final stage or a given stage of a lot of different disease, bacterial, virus, fungal, inhalation, vasculitis, peritonitis, pancreatitis, coming from the lung or outside the lung. The lung is a sort of a final target but we do not have to forget that the theology is completely important. And when we don't have to forget that maybe there is something different if I have a, a bacteria pneumonia from pneumococcus, Klebsiella, or Staphylococcus, or a pancreatitis. We are used to lump everything together, but with the advances of the medicine of our understanding, we are a, understanding that maybe in this big, under this big umbrella, we have a different, uh, different phenotype and possibly different way of treatment, at least in a different time. So we have a different trial in RDS. We have possible targets on the trial are the etiology by theology, pneumonia, sepsis, inhalation, etc. We may have trial on pathogenesis, which is substantially is an edema formation and reduction of the lung size. And then we have the symptoms. We have a trial on mechanical ventilation. And usually the target is to buy time to provide good gas exchange and we may look some mechanics or some hemodynamics. But remember now, the RDS is just bilateral infiltrates and hypoxemia. There is no mention for mechanical and so on, because uh, this uh, definition was uh, following a sort of compromise uh, uh, from different experts. And uh, as you know, when you have a 10 or 15 experts around the table, the consensus is reached at the lowest level possible. Anyway, this is the classical RDS. Look here, 12 August, 1980. I didn't say too much. This patient has a, had a previous pneumothorax. This patient was in one of the first estacorporal support. You can see here the cannula the return cannula in the, in the vena cava, and you have the input cannula here. But this uh, 
is uh, was the ARDS. ARDS, according to the original definition, was something which affects bilaterally the problem. The lungs are stiff. This was the classic stiff lung, is what part of the definition of the RDS. Hypoxemia was uh, refractory, that means non responsive to oxygen, that means uh, refractory. Even given 100% oxygen, you cannot reach normal PO2. That means refractory hypoxemia is PF lower than 100. This was the original definition of the RDS, not minus than 300. One than 100. And this was the picture. And for years, we had uh, this was close at the start of the intensive care uh, of the, as a discipline. And uh, was our syndrome, because intensive care grew up uh, with RDS, in which you have all the, pro all the possible problems. You have the respiratory problem. You have the hemodynamics. You have the kidney problem. You have infectious problem. You have to nourish this patient out. So all the concentrate of intensive care action are summarized in this ARDS. And uh, bilateral infiltrates. And for years, uh, it was thought that the RDS was something like that. So why to do the CT scan? The radiologist didn't want to do any CT scan because waste of time. And what do we expect? We have bilateral infiltrates and that's it. However, the CT scan changed our view of RDS, because we had part of the lung which was pretty good. And this was called baby lung. Because if you look at the distribution of the pixel, that means all of the voxel, all the little elements which build up the entire lung, you know, these are the city number, minus 700 means 30% tissue, 70% gas. That means in a normal lung, you have about one third of the lung volume is occupied by tissue, and uh, two thirds are uh, the gas volume, the FRC. But when you have, when we have ARDS, the normal lung is very, very reduced, and we have a peak here, which is around zero. So the RDS was classified as small lung, small gas volume. The dimension was the dimension of the baby, and we called baby lung. And having the baby lung, we start to look at uh, the compliance. The compliance was not related to the amount of the bad lung, but the compliance was related to the amount of good lung, of the baby lung. That means the in RDS, the lung is not stiff, it's small because the intrinsic compliance, I mean, if you normalize the compliance for the gas volume, is almost normal in RDS in all the studies we did. So saying low gas means to say low compliance. In an adult, you have a normal compliance at an adult size. So this was the most important, I think, achievement in understanding the pathophysiology of the RDS, of the classical RDS, in the, when we start to do the CIS scan. And having the baby lung, we say, well, why not to put the patient in prone position? And immediately after the first CT scan, we start to put the patient in prone position. Because we say, okay, now, we put the, the perfusion, we go here, the black will be good. But when we put the proposition and we took a CT scan, we found that the density moves. So the baby lung was not something anatomically fixed, it was a sort of functional concept and come out with a sponge lung. So let's see, I am in the space without gravitational force. I have in the interstitial edema, and increase the mass. I have a big edema, big mass. Now, the gas tissue ratio will be similar in all parts of the lung. Now, if I put the gravity, this part of the lung weight on this and this weight on this. And so what's happened? I have a progressive increasing of size here, decreases of size here. 
and we have only this part of the lung which is still uh, open and uh, this uh, is the baby lung and this explains the effect of prone position and in a classical rds and also explain the effect of peep why peep because with the peep i counteract the compression of these atelectasis of course if i increase the pressure I counteract here by it. I increase the pressure here. So PIP is always a compromise. So the classical RDS, we have a normal part of the lung, smaller way collapse, alveolar collapse and resorption, and some units are occupied. So whatever pressure I put, I cannot open if the units, pulmonary units are full with something else. So this uh, is the general picture of RDS. This is, a, uh, this is a rather complicated. We have a gas, uh, we have a, um, atelectasis, a consolidation, and we had inflammation in red. And you see that in yellow is the inflammation. In red are the zone of big anomogeneity. In here, you have the zone of collapse. And you see that the RDS is a very big <clears throat> umbrella, which put on under the same name patient like this, which are almost healthy, but bilateral infiltrates are present. And <clears throat> we appear to end patient like this. Now the protocol of RDS, that the people love protocols. When they do not know physiology, the protocol is the perfect, good. But do, are you sure that you may apply the same protocol in patient like this or in patient like this? Call it the RDS, okay. But don't you think that these uh, phenotypes, that means how they appear, phenos means appearance, <coughs> are just different. And I think this is an important lesson that COVID gave us. And we start with COVID like this, you see, and we have that. 50 per day, well, 16 patients, uh, I think were collected in, a, in a, I know, I know, I think, I know, they were collected by David Acumello, and you see that half of these patients, very few, so big scandal, oh, so few patients, how do you say with so few patients? But remember, for the physiology, you don't need big numbers. You need a few patients well studied. Remember that the RDS was described in 12 patients, and the only most significant advances in physiopathology has never been done in study with number of patients greater than 20. Maximum, I remember, once 40. Now, these were 16 patients, and 50% of the patients had a normal compliance, greater than 50. In a supine patient, another supine patient, these are pretty normal values. And they were associated with the deep hypoxemia, right to left shunt from 30 to 70%. Now, the combination of very good compliance and very severe hypoxemia, of course, under the big umbrella, maybe exists in RDS, but with this kind of frequency, this is a specific disease with a peculiar characteristics. And at the beginning, you have this characteristic, flexible lung, severe hypoxemia. And as an example, this is a Grasselli paper, and the authors claim at the end that the RDS, typical RDS, CARS are the same thing, and the RDS of COVID are the same thing. Look, this is a table in the supplementum, COVID-19 patient, 297, compliance. 43, 42, 40. Classical RDS, 37, 31, 28. And the amount of a PF lower than 100 is far more frequent in COVID patients with normal or greater than normal compliance compared to the other one. And this didn't take in account the time of observation, which is crucial. The slide I showed it before, those were done in early phase and measured in standard condition of PIP. 
every patient at the same five centimeter of water. Now, let me give you this example. Early COVID patient, look here, density are present, not so much. Supine, five centimeter of water. Prone, five centimeter of water. Supine, 35 centimeter of water. That means a sort of recruitment maneuver. That means I can call a telectasis, which is open at 35, and I can call consolidation, what remain closed at 35. And you see the recruitment is about 8%, and we don't have a great difference between supine and prone. Look at this intermediate COVID-19, supine 5, supine 35, look. I have a tremendous recruitment, 40%. Look in proposition, I have redistribution of density. As in RDS, we found in the typical RDS. PO2, 88, under 4, under 35, some increase, not big. Let's go a little bit advanced. There are supine 5, supine 35, Recruitment, zero. Look at the density. They stay all here. That means we change from a telectasis as a cause of density, mainly to the fibrosis. And this is the compliance. And you see the compliance go from 60, all these are 60, 70, 80, with time goes down. Because the disease progress and maybe the treatment contribute. A wrong treatment may contribute to a progression of the disease. And the poor lung reacts as it can, inflammation and fibrosis. Nothing magic. The lung has volume goes down. And you see, as, in a, as since ever, since we started with the CT scan years and years ago, we have the gas volume and respiratory system compliance are very well related. PaCO2 goes up with time. Remember, the PCO2 far more than oxygenation declares, depicts, and signals the structural changes of the lung. When the lung structure is altered, that means fibrosis, rupture, fi uh, microthrombosis, dead space, uh, uh, pulmonary embolism, the structure is deeply altered, the PCO2 goes up. This has also, in many, many years ago, in a early versus late RDS. But oxygenation, look here, the oxygenation did not change. Even when the density were uh, very modest, when the recruitability was very low at the beginning, when the compliance was very good, uh, we have a very bad PO2 and FIO2. Here, the intercept at zero is 100. After three weeks, uh, still 100. Gas exchange follows precise mathematical rule. If I have the lung, which is flexible because it's full of gas, and the hypoxemia is very severe, there is only one explanation, perfusion. The perfusion has uh, some problem. So the lung perfusion is anomogeneous. And this, we should have understand that since the first CT and the first blood gases we took in this patient. And after that has been confirmed by several reports in which you say that, that quite strangely, here you should have no perfusion, we have the greatest perfusion because you will lose the hypoxic vasoconstriction. I don't want to go in the details, but all this, papers clearly show the alteration of the parenchymal perfusion. So at the beginning, at least, the main cause of hypoxemia 
in the VAQ maldistribution. Maldistribution, that means that in some regions of the lung, we have too much VA and low perfusion. And this works as a dead space. In other lung, part of the lung, we have a lot of perfusion and very small, uh, and very small uh, ventilation. These works act as a shunt. The true shunt is when the ventilation is not reduced, it's become zero, okay? So we propose a sort of a schema, which is linked to the time. And we call type L and type H. I mean, the inventor of LH was, was Camporota, really. No? It suggests LH seems a good idea, good. Because L is low elastic, that means good compliance. Low VQ, it not means much. low VQ, which is plain hypoxemia. Low lung weight, because we do not have great uh, edema. If we don't have edema, we don't have collapse. If we don't have collapse, we don't have recruitability. And the recruitability is extremely poor. So the explanation here of the problem is in the perfusion because this tells that this specific subtype of RDS, if you want to call it RDS and not COVID-19 pneumonia, is vasocentric, is not alveolocentric. And then you have hypoxemia. And immediately, the intensive is when you see the PO2 go down, jump, and jump on to correct the PO2. Remember, sometimes the PO2 may be 60 when the patient will stay very well without helmet, mask, a very strange thing. Anyway, let's say you give a non-invasive support, which is perfect, you're right. But in a fraction of patients, despite the non-invasive support, you see that the patient continue to have a big inspiratory effort. They arrive at an emergency room, some have no dysnea because the lungs are flexible. They have increased respiratory rate, increased respiratory volume. They arrive with the PCO2 around 30, 32. They have a bigger inspiration, but they don't feel dysnea because they get how much gas they want. But if you put this one on air, messy pap and so on, and you have to look if they continue to have excessive inspiratory effort. Because if you have in excess inspiratory effort, you have the patient induced, the self induced lung injury, which was described in the early 90s and was by re reinforced the concept by Brochard present as Lasky recently. And uh, what is the difference of really? No. In the VILI, the motor of everything is the respirator. So the energy comes from the electricity. In a patient in the lung injury, the motor of the muscle and the energy comes from the pasta shoot and steak you, give, you keep. But the other results in the problem in the, in the lungs are exactly the same. Excessive transpulmonary pressure may aggravate this uh, situation. So we add to the natural progression, we add, we possibly add a damage. To interrupt this damage, if this doesn't work, you adjust intubation, which is not early intubation, it's the right intubation. It's not early versus late, it doesn't mean anything. It's right versus wrong. You have to give intubation at the right time. Now here we stop, but maybe they think continue, or if we do not stop, they continue. And we have at the end, the classical RDS, in which we need higher people, we need prompt position, so on. This we call type H. After the type H, also the recruitability goes down. As I showed you before, there is a, the, when the fibrosis take prevalence. And this is a friend of mine. This was, Early, seven days after, look, look at the PO2, perfectly normal, and the PO2, excuse me, perfectly abnormal, 95, perfectly abnormal, 84. With this line and this line. Would you use the same PEEP? 
in this patient. Would you fold the peep table here as you follow here? Look at the lung composition. I'm absolutely astonished to see how so many colleagues say, okay, but this is the same as the other one. How is possible to say something like that? If you follow the course of the disease, if you put everything together, okay, but you do not understand anything of this specific disease. So this tile apple, non-invasive support, mechanical ventilation to prevent theory if the effort persists. And in this patient, we wrote, okay, we may use also a tidal volume greater than eight, big scandal. Let me, if I have a patient like this and the PCO2 is 60, and I have some problem with hypercamia, which always hypercamia means reabsorption at the latency. Why should I give seven or eight if my plateau pressure maybe is 20 or 21? So when I am extremely far from the any threshold of ventilation induced lung injury, we are not speaking about the baby lung. This is an adult lung with severe hypoxemia, which recognize other causes. At the end, Shan develops but not at the beginning. You may use some paper, I put eight to 10, why not? Just to prevent in patient which you are sedated and so on, some of the latest, as you have in normal healthy lung, when you induce anesthesia, paralysis and so on, you may have some problem. And we say prone position is not mandatory. Okay, it does increase the PO2 sometimes, of certain level, when you put back, everything turn, returns at a baseline. Prone position in terms of mortality is mandatory when it helps to distribute better the stress and strain. Here, stress and strain are not a problem. Become a problem if the, page, if the people use the big tables and maybe end up with 20 of PIP, as happened in this kind of patient. At this point, you have a problem of stress and strain, but are due not to the disease, but to the doctors. With a mechanical ventilation type H, you can do whatever you want, whatever you want. You can follow strictly the rules. Be always careful that the only thing we show it with PIP is the P greater than 15 may kill a fraction of patients. We don't have any evidence that seven is better or worse than 15. And we have a lot of studies about that. Proposition, we know in this condition is essential. These are the conditions in which we have the real baby lab. So I will end with this sort of a Vitruvian Leonardo map, which is the lung characteristics of COVID, the summer. In red, recruitability, which means edema and atelectasis. They start very low because hypoxemia has different. They goes up in an intermediate. Maybe the patient are admitted intensive care. Maybe somebody gives some more water than necessary. And the water gets to the lungs, so we start to have more edema. So we have a lot of possible things that uh, creates uh, this situation. Then with time, the atelectasis seems to disappear and we go in the late stages uh, in which uh, proposition, recruitment, uh, PEEP, uh, nothing work. So this is a sort of arc ancien. Then we have uh, PSO2 and consolidation they get continuously up during the course of the disease. Compliance in unresolved pneumonia, because this interesting pneumonia may interrupt at any phase, but in the patient which is not solved, this is the course. And compliance, which was progressively down. Oxygenation, my dear friend, 
is always bad without great changes. So, and I finish, I don't think exists the treatment of COVID-19 pneumonia. Does exist several treatments which have to be tailored to the different phases. That means we have to simply apply the personalized medicine which was invented not by the big numbers, but the Hippocrates about 3,000 years ago. Thank you for the attention. Thank you very much. Thank you for the session. That was, as usual, a big pleasure. So now we have 10 minutes or something like that for any questions from the audience, right? We have the chat open. Um, if someone wants to ask any question, you can put it in the chat, we can see it, and we can answer that from here. Don't be shy. <laughs> what are our parameters to stop sedation or muscle relaxation? From Maria Loela de Leon. So I think the real question is when to start with sedation and muscle reaction. I think uh, to me, the key point for the treatment with this patient is played during the first days. If we have the continuous inspiratory effort, despite non-invasive support from just oxygen to the non-invasive ventilation, I think you need to intubate the patient. That means the drive in this patient is extraordinarily high. And I would not hesitate to, with the sedation alone, it's impossible to drive, to, to, to stop it. And I would use at the beginning uh, sedation and paralysis. When? The problem is, uh, if you look at the oxygenation, it goes up immediately. No start to win this patient because the disease is still active. I would stop paralysis and sedation when decreasing the paralysis and sedation, I look at the, the P01, the, the inspiratory effort of the patient, or esophageal pressure, or the amount in the spontaneous breathing, assisted breathing of the diaphragm movement, or the swings of the central venous pressure, or the swings or the um, esophageal pressure, or a strict observation of uh, respiratory muscle, uh, nose, uh, sternocleidomastoid, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. So you start to stop sedation and so on to decrease when the inspiratory efforts are decent, not excessive. To me, this is the key point to dictate the intubation in one side and the weeding in the other side. This mm -hmm. disease takes long time. Very good. <clears throat> Thank you very much. There is another question here um, from Jorge Rodriguez. Uh, I'd like to know, uh, I think you, you spoke already about that a little bit, but maybe to, to have a little bit further explanation. I'd like to know which one you think is the best way to set the best PIP for your patient. <laughs> well, I in this in in this kind of uh, I mean the best PIP does not exist. Exist uh, the less dangerous PIP, uh, which is always a compromise. At the beginning, when the recruitability is zero, you don't need more than something between five, six, seven, eight of PIP. It's a disaster if you put twenty. And if you have method that stresses and so on, more healthy is the lung, greater is the PIP you end up. We show that, we know that. So be careful with PIP. And uh, anyway, don't use never PIP greater than 15. And I would uh, overcome 10 only in patients uh, in which uh, in the late phase or intermediate late phase, when you have uh, the CT, big density in the dependent regions, uh, that means uh, you have uh, a big atelectasis or when the response to proposition is very high. But don't exceed to PIP. And please, 
please, anytime you touch the knobs of beep, look at the hemodynamics. Because the real problem in this patient are the hemodynamics, which are always neglected. We correct giving fluids and, and cardioactive drugs, but it may be devastating for the lung. We saw that experimentally very, very, very clearly. Very good. <clears throat> I have another question that I have the feeling that uh, actually also Dr. Camporota later on or in the next session on the 25th will be really pleased to to say something, but there is a question from Duk Nam, uh, which is asking, what is the role of CO2 removal in COVID ARDS? Well, Maybe it's a yeah. long question. It's, yeah. Well, no, but, well, it depends. In, during the pandemic, the extracorporeal support is always problematic. Let's see that you have space and time, okay? And uh, the role of CO2 removal is exactly as uh, I think uh, in, uh, in other conditions. When the ventilation you provide is uh, requires uh, too much stress and strain, uh, to uh, buy time, uh, you have to, to uh, add the CO2 removal. In the real late phase, when you're full of fibrosis, well, you may try, I don't expect anything, anything good. And when you do CO2 removal, please be careful with the ventilation of the natural lung. Be careful with the so-called ultra-protective ventilation because ultra-protective ventilation without some expansion means that after 48 hours, you find your lung, which has become a piece of stone. We observe that consistently in animals with healthy lung. Is a, or you use a 25 of PEEP, which is a disaster for the hemodynamic, or you have a progressive collapse. You, you may have some breath, three, four breaths per minute. Play with frequency when you use a low, a CO2 remover, more than with the total volume. Of course, you decrease if the total volume is excessive, but play overall with frequency to reduce the mechanical power. Okay. So I think uh, for the time being, it's, it's okay. I think we need to go to the next speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gattinoni. That was really a pleasure as usual, a big, big pleasure. Um, there are many questions. I guess people really would like to ask you a lot of things because they really appreciate being uh, in front of the expert, but, but the time is limited. So once again, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, by the way, um, you may notice that we have several Professor Davide Cumelo, right? There is only one <laughs> that is going to be talking now. So this is any kind of like a, you know, Zoom um, thing that we have. This is one of the things of, of being live, right? So after Professor Gattinoni, now I will give the room to, to Professor Cumelo. Are you there? Thank you to everybody. I think that Professor Gattinoni have to disconnect the screen. Okay, yep. These are the beauties of working online, right? Yep. Yep. I did, I suppose. That's good. Hmm? There you are. Now it's working. Okay. I see okay. start the screen also, I, I would like to thank Okay, David, I can go home. Yep. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, please. The screen? Uh, I see, I don't know the rest of the people. I see uh, okay. has to start the screen sharing, okay. but it's just a okay. blank screen. Okay. Okay, good afternoon. Thanks to everybody. The, in the next uh, 20, 25 minutes, I will speak regarding non invasive ventilatory support. So, this 
got the, um, how is made the respiratory system. So, and by the chest wall. So every time a uh, race to the alveolar, so uh, is used to expand the lung. I'm, I'm going to interrupt you, sorry. Um, I think there's an issue with the line. We don't see the screen, with the, uh, the, we don't see the presentation and also the voice is kind of uh, 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 struggling. I think it's because of the, of the connectivity of the internet. I, I see the screen. Okay, now we see the screen. Now we see the presentation. Now, uh, do you see the screen? Yeah. Okay, so here in this scheme is uh, how is made the respiratory system. So the respiratory system is composed by the lung and by the chest wall. In passive condition, when we inflate the respiratory system by mechanical ventilation, mechanical ventilation apply in, uh, for example, an increase in high work pressure. This increase in high work pressure is spent to inflate the lung and to inflate the chest wall. So what inflate the lung is the transpulmonary pressure. So the pressure inside the alveoli and the pressure outside the alveoli. So the difference between the two. So the pressure uh, uh, that comes from the ventilator, if we are in complete passive condition, or from the muscle, if we are in spontaneous breathing, or both if we are in a system ventilation, is used to elastance of the respiratory system to generate a sort amount of the tidal volume. Then this pressure is also used to generate a flow, which is related to the highway resistant and to overcome the possible presence of intrinsic peak. So the pressure is spent to inflate the lung. This is a, a pressure volume curve in a normal condition and in patient with low compliance. So in normal acetized patient, for example, we apply 10 centimeters of water of pressure to generate a half liter of tidal volume. If the condition of the lung change, for example, for pneumonia, for uh, um, a sedation, for paralysis, if we have to reach the same amount of tidal volume, we have to apply a higher amount of pressure. Then we have another condition. So the lung present the same condition, but what change is the resistance? This is normal patient, and here is the pressure spent to, to overcome the resistance to the high rate. In this case, for example, in asthma condition, we have to generate a higher amount of pressure to overcome the resistance while the condition of the lung are the same. So try to put together resistance and passive condition or in assisted mechanical ventilation or spontaneous breathing, we have to increase the transpulmonary pressure. And the higher is the transpulmonary pressure, higher could be the damage into the lung. So a possible increase in the ventilator-induced lung injury. But look here what's happened to the pleural pressure. If we apply positive pressure ventilation, we have an increase in the pleural pressure. And this 
translate in a country if the patient is in spontaneous breathing the pleural pressure is negative and higher is the decrease in the pleural pressure higher can be the damage into the lung regarding the possible increase in the lung edema so what we have to remember every time we ventilate the patient with respiratory failure the lung is characterized by increasing permeability so increasing the capillary link lung edema with possible impairment in gas exchange possible impairment in respiratory mechanics increase in inspiratory effort respiratory drive which translate an increase in the swing in pleural pressure all these conditions so increasing respiratory drive increasing inspiratory effort can increase for example the tidal volume and the patient self-inflicted lung injury so we have to stop this vicious cycle this is again two conditions this is the, in the left a patient that is mechanical ventilator but represent a very stiff chest wall so in the alveolar we can have a very high pressure for for example 30 centimeters of water but due to the stiff chest wall the pleural pressure can be very high so the transpulmonary pressure again the difference between the pressure inside the alveolar and outside the alveolar can be quite low look here here is a typical patient that uh, we can find for example with a respiratory failure and we apply non-invasive ventilation with for example a pressure support of 10 centimeters of water so in the alveolar at end inspiration the pressure is the pressure applied from the ventilator but uh, because the patient present a very high inspiratory effort it can generate a very negative pleural pressure so the transpulmonary pressure very high look here 25 centimeters of water this transpulmonary pressure can be present in passive condition in patient with severe rds so it does not any sense to say that non-invasive ventilation is less injury compared to invasive ventilation depends which is the transpulmonary pressure generated during the inspiration how can we support the patient with non-invasive ventilatory support we can apply the helmet with helmet i suggest to use CPAP not to use pressure support on the contrary with a mask it's possible to use CPAP or to use pressure support and which is the advantage of non-invasive support is that in addition to increase FIU2 it can recruit the lung so can decrease the shunt and can decrease the amount of hypoxemia these are the possible use of non-invasive ventilatory support so we use non-invasive ventilatory support to improve oxygenation to reduce the work of breathing to reduce the dis dyspnea to avoid intubation and to reduce as much as possible the complication associated with invasive mechanical ventilation with the helmet we can have several advantage compared to the mask so for example the patient can receive 
normal hydration, can present a lower amount of leak, can avoid the fascial skin lesion, and the helmet is independent of the patient anatomy. Regarding the disadvantage, of course, are the noise, the large death space, the claustrophobia, and with the helmet, we don't have any ventilator monitoring, such as the tidal volume. We can, can monitor only the respiratory rate. With non-invasive ventilation, with mask, we can have some problem. For example, inefic triggering due to air leaks, auto triggering, inappropriate pressurization, delayed cycle, so difficult from inspiration to expiration, possible CO2 rebreathing. But uh, every time we apply no ventilatory support, we have to remind the possible failure. In this figure are reported the percentage of failure regarding the underlying disease. For example, patient with cardiopulmonary edema treated with CPAP of pressure support have lower than 10% of failure. But look here, patient with severe RDS can have a failure between 40-50%, so very high, my friend. Regarding the clinical recommendation, here are reported the official ERS ATS that was released more than three years ago regarding the use of non-invasive ventilation in patients with acute respiratory failure. Patients with acute respiratory failure are defined patients with a P2 FRO2 ratio lower than 200 and with a respiratory rate higher than 30, 10, 35 breaths per minute, excluding COPD patients. And what uh, they suggest, given the absence of good evidence, we are unable to offer a strict recommendation to use non-invasive ventilation in patients with acute respiratory failure. However, the same deadline suggesting that a trial of non-invasive ventilation might be offered to patients with hypoxemia respiratory failure. CPAP and early RDS with a close monitor and frequent revaluation. Remember, the patient with RDS can fail up to 40, 45%. Rate of intubation can be high. And some study reported that non-invasive ventilation could decrease the possible risk of intubation. However, no difference were found in terms of the mortality. This was uh, uh, just released one year ago regarding the use of non-invasive ventilation in patients with acute respiratory failure. And again, non-invasive ventilation seems not protective for patients with acute respiratory failure. The, and what we have to look, every time we apply non-invasive ventilation, we have to look at the tidal volume because high tidal volume can increase the patient self-inflicted lung injury. And we have also to remind 
when the patient fail when he's treated with non-invasive ventilation. So we have early failure and late failure. Usually the early failure are used to patient discomfort, to the leak, to claustrophobia, and to high tidal volume. And in the case the patient is intubated, the patient can have a favor outcome. On the contrary, when patient failed in the late phase is always due to the underlying disease and the medical therapy is already started. So in this patient, we cannot, we cannot offer anything more. So what we have to look and what we have to ask when non-invasive failure. So we have to look regarding the quality of the mask. We have to look the patient ventilator synchrony. We have to change the PEEP, the level of pressure support. And remember, the longer the patient has been in the hospital. So the longer the patient is treated with non-invasive ventilation, unfortunately, the patient will have a worse outcome compared to patient who failed in the early phase. And also we have to look of the possible presence of potential reversible things. This was a very interesting study a single center in patient who underwent non-invasive ventilatory support with acute respiratory failure. And the patient were divided according to success or failure. At baseline, there was a minimal difference regarding the impairment of oxygenation, while no change regarding the PCO2 and after one hour, any difference regarding the two groups. What uh, happened is uh, during the day, this was very interesting. So no difference regarding the level of pressure support, uh, but a huge difference, not only statistically, but clinically regarding the minute ventilation. So patient who, failure knee and were intubated present a very high minute ventilation and very high tidal volume. So please remind that patient that are risk to failure are patient who generate a very high tidal volume. And why generate a very high tidal volume? Because they generate a very high inspiratory effort. They generate a very high muscle effort. Another important point is that only 20% of the patient during non-invasive ventilatory support receive a short amount of sedation or analgesic. So I suggest to use remifentanil or propofol because it seems effective, safe, and is able to reduce the inspiratory effort. Regarding the COVID, already Professor Gattinoni presented this slide, is not only the level of hypoxemia, but is the amount of the disease. Here, the amount of the disease is very low. So patient treating this phase could have a better outcome compared to patient in this phase. So my suggestion is not only to look at the impairment of oxygenation, but also the extension of the disease, the minute ventilation, the respiratory rate, so the possible desynchrony. If you use non-invasive ventilatory support in patient with COVID-19. 
This was a possible flow chart that you can use. This was recently published by our group. Our group. So we decide to start a non-invasive ventilation, not only in patient presented Pu2, FR2 lower than 200, but also in patient with respiratory rate higher than 30 breaths per minute. So we start the CPAP by helmet. Then we repeat arterial blood gas analysis after 20 minutes and see the respiratory rate. So if the patient presents an increase in pure FR2 ratio and in decreasing respiratory rate, my suggestion is that this patient can continue CPAP. On the contrary, if patient remain, still remain with very high respiratory rate associated with a significant impairment of oxygenation, you can increase PEEP up to 10 centimeters of water and reevaluate the patient. And if the patient still presents a very high respiratory rate, you can try a trial of non-invasive ventilation with a similar level of PEEP and pressure support between eight and 10 centimeters of water. Another possible tool is the use of prone position during the application of non-invasive ventilatory support in patients with COVID-19. This was a CT scan performed in patient with RDS, so without COVID, by moving from supine to prone and again to supine. And as you can see, the use of prone position was associated to significant reduction in consolidation in the, the previous dependent part of the lung. So why oxygenation improve? Because prone position is associated with a more homogeneous ventilation perfusion distribution with a possible lung recruitment, a change in the chest wall. There are at the present time, no data of a randomized control trial on use of prone position in patient during no invasive ventilatory support with COVID-19. This was one of the most recent study this how the patient can uh, be put in prone position. This was a single center study, only 50, 55 patients, and the majority of the patients were treated by helmet and the minority with only oxygen therapy. And here are the results from supine to prone and again to supine. Similar level of PEEP in average eight centimeters of water. The use of prone position was a significant increase in the oxygenation, but by returning to supine, there was no more different. No different regarding the respiratory rate, no different regarding the PCO2. The use of prone position was associated to a reduction in the level of the apnea, and regarding the comfort remain in the majority of the case quite acceptable. So my friend, my conclusion is that non-invasive ventilatory support can promote the ventilator induced lung injury similar to invasive mechanical ventilation. During non-invasive ventilatory support, you should to evaluate and to monitor the tidal volume and the respiratory rate as a possible sign of the distress. In COVID-19, use careful the non-invasive ventilatory support and promote the use of prone position. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Cumelo. It was really good as usual. Very interesting, especially these days where people is all the time talking invasive, non-invasive. So now we have uh, 10 minutes when people can post their, their questions. So you have the question and answer uh, section where you can ask anything to Professor Cumelo.
I don't see anything coming through. Okay. Something is, there is some activity. No questions from the audience? Okay. So there is one question here from Frederico Gordo, uh, which is, what do you think about the high flow nasal cannula? Hot topic. Yeah, hot topic. High flow uh, nasal cannula can be used, can be used. Uh, remember that uh, uh, can be less effective compared to CPAP because with CPAP we can reach uh, with a PIP up to 10 centimeters of water. So my suggestion is if you have a patient uh, with uh, a high respiratory rate is to start as soon as possible the use of non-invasive ventilatory support. On the contrary, if the patient presents no sign of the distress, very quiet respiratory rate, so you can use this uh, device. But remember the, eff the effect on reduction of work on breathing is significantly lower compared CPAP or pressure support, for sure. Good. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, actually, we... If I have time. Sorry. Oh. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, because there is another no, question. I have time waiting. Yeah. The problem is not to improve the oxygenation. Of course, oxygena oxygenation is important. But the problem is to avoid the patient and self-inflicted lung injury. So we have to recognize the possible high inspiratory effort. And these are the patients that we can treat in the early phase by use CPAP or pressure support. So the goal is to reduce the work of breathing and relax the patient. Okay, so actually there's another question here. How do you win this patient, the one on, on high, high flow oxygen? The problem is that uh, uh, when we start non-invasive ventilatory support, the average time in my uh, data, but also in the data comes from the literature, spent uh, between four and five days in CPAP or pressure support. So this is the average time. My suggestion is not uh, to stop suddenly. So to start, for example, from continuous 24 hours, then to apply 12 hours spontaneous breathing, then 12 hours in uh, non-invasive ventilatory support, first day, the second days, 18 hours, and the third days, you can stop everything. So be good. patient, be patient. As a winning <laughs> in intubate patient. Because it is not only disease of the lung, it's a systemic disease. Mm -hmm. This is the problem of COVID-19. There is another question here that sounds quite interesting, which is non-invasive ventilation can generate more over distension? Of course, depending on the transpulmonary pressure. As uh, I show in the slide, if you have a, a patient with a very high drive, very high inspiratory effort, can generate a very high transpulmonary pressure, similarly or sometimes higher than invasive mechanical ventilation. So we have to measure the pleural pressure. So my suggestion is to, to use esophageal balloon to have an idea regarding the work of breathing, regarding transpulmonary pressure generated by the patient. This is my suggestion. Otherwise you are blind. Very good. I have another one here. Good CPAP give the same degree of VI, LI at different pressures, the same kind of um, lung injury. <clears throat> 
depending in each patient, depending again on the inspiratory effort generated by the patient. And uh, uh, another point that uh, uh, non-invasive ventilation can be uh, can be useful regarding the hemodynamic, because sometimes what uh, we see in this patient seems uh, quite good regarding the hemodynamics. Then uh, the patient remain uh, uh, tachypnoic, uh, very hypoxemic. So we intubate it, and then it's a catastrophe regarding the hemodynamics. Very good. <clears throat> there is another question that is quite also a hot topic these days, which is in non-invasive um, ventilation. So do you have any advices or any tricks um, to minimize aerosols? Hmm. But uh, <laughs> uh, at the beginning of this pandemic, we were uh, much focused regarding the possible aerosol and transmission of the virus. But uh, there are several data that uh, suggest that uh, the virus, the spread of the virus in the environment due to the CPAP or pressure support is not a major problem. That's really interesting, actually. Very good. Thank you. Another question is, um, what makes you switch from invasive ventilation, uh, sorry, from non-invasive to invasive ventilation? Are you looking at the PAO2 or the PCO2? What is your um, advice in this sense? I look, of course, PO2. PCO2, if PCO2 increase and minute ventilation increase, pay attention. This is very dangerous because something absent is happening. And also I look at the esophageal pressure and I look at the patient, the coordination between the thorax and the abdomen. And I ask to the patient how the patient feels. Very good. I think for now, um, okay, what is the place for chest physiotherapy? Um, I assume this question uh, is related to what, what is what is your, your experience in chest physiotherapy in this kind of patients? Very important. Very important. is a very useful tool. Has to ensure a good hydration and good nutrition. Okay. So please open your mind, not only look the blood gas analysis or CPAP or pressure support, but also use steroids, heparin, uh, chest physiotherapy. So look in the, in the all, not only particularly. That's good. I think for, uh, for now, that's it. We answered the questions. Um, that was very fluent and actually quite interesting. So thank you very much, Professor Timelo. It was, as usual, very, very interesting, very good. So now we will go to the next speaker, Dr. Camporota. Hello, there you are. Hello, everyone. <laughs> thank you very much for, <clears throat> for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be able to share some time and some thoughts with you all. I know I, I cannot see you, but I can see the numbers and I'll see the interaction has been very good. So if I am allowed to share some slides, are you able to see it, David? Yep, perfect. Perfect. So first of all, yep. I'd like to, you know, I'd like to thank for inviting me and also like a special thank to Professor Gattinoni for having spent so much time with me over the last few months and teaching me a lot of things and also for making my life easier for this talk because has given quite a lot of information already about invasive mechanical ventilation 
So I'm just going to concentrate on three points. Um, one is some of the general characteristics of COVID ARDS. Uh, Professor Gattinoni has already um, um, given quite a lot of details, but I'd like to pick out some of the essential characteristics which are then useful for the disease outcome, but also for the mechanical ventilation. And I'm going to concentrate on one question. When we deal with mechanical ventilation in COVID-19, is it about mechanics or is it about oxygenation mainly? So just looking at the first two, we, we know that particularly at the beginning, in, uh, during the March, uh, April, at the beginning of the pandemics, it, it was very unclear what was the, core, the, the outcome. Was it about patient characteristics or the timing of presentation? And you can see there the timing of intubation, the outcomes, etc. Is it about resources? Quite clearly during during a pandemic, there are some consideration to do with best care, some considerations about uh, evidence-based, and there are some considerations that are quite pragmatic, and they're normally due to resource utilization, uh, uh, availability of capacity within the ICU and also outside the, the ICU. And then there is another phenomenon, which is about how much, if any, uh, role of mechanical ventilation and the different strategy can play on the outcome. So I'll concentrate, first of all, on the left-hand side of this flowchart, and then in the, in the second half of this talk, just mainly on the right-hand side of this, uh, of this uh, very simple flow diagram. So one of the things that's been said um, again and again today is that hypoxemia in COVID-19 is a little more complex, uh, I think, than, than the traditional or classical ARDS or respiratory failure that we've seen so far. It's because it's an overlap between a dysregulation of pulmonary perfusion uh, there is also some immunothrombosis when, with uh, micro and sort of large and small vessel thrombosis. And then obviously there is the more classical form, which is the ARDS-like, which is due to the pulmonary edema. And you can see there at the bottom uh, where lung consolidation is from minimal to very prevalent. And I quite like this slide from this, well, I like this study from which I derived this slide, which is basically, this was the initial report from the Wuhan experience. And that's mainly a CT scan report where you can see <clears throat> going from CT scan from, from patient at subclinical level to different stages in their disease progression up to late, two, three weeks after the symptom onset. What you can see is two things. One is that at the beginning, the um, disease is mainly compartmentalized, unilateral or multifocal, but it's mainly ground glass. So there's no consolidation there. It's just very diffuse ground glass, something that we've um, grown quite accustomed to looking and appreciating as a COVID disease. But then over time, the ground glass is reduced and in its place is consolidation where it becomes bilateral and diffuse. So that's quite an important characteristic that goes back to what Professor Gattinoni was talking about earlier on, which is the timing of the disease, which is quite fundamental. Now, the other thing is that what determines the uh, disease progression? Quite clearly, there are some uh, radiological considerations. So you can see this is a study where they looked at uh, chest X-ray scoring and timing of intubation and, and um, uh, progression. You can see that if you divide the, seat, the chest X-ray into quadrants, uh, actually they're all quadrant segments in sixes, you can see that the greater the involvement of chest X-ray, clearly the greater the uh, chances of intubation and disease progression. So this is not surprising to us. 
but you can see that on the severity score. The same thing is for CT scans. So this is a pattern zero to three um, uh, and a pattern four, which essentially is diffuse bilateral with a CT scoring greater than 10. You can see, first of all, the disease-free survival goes down over time and it's clearly different from patients with less involvement on CT scan. But also in the same study, what they point out is the importance of inflammation. So you can see here the same pattern of disease, with a different level of CRP, C-reactive protein. The more inflamed patients have got a more, uh, less uh, probability of resolution and a prolonged duration of symptoms. Now, alongside the importance of inflammatory markers, we've measured quite a lot of ferritin, everyone, and you can see it's clearly associated with more severe disease versus a less severe disease. And clearly D-dimers. This is again one of the, one of the early uh, studies on the right hand side where you can see the association between D-dimers, uh, um, IL-6 and serum ferritin as a marker of more um, progressive disease and certainly more associated with non-survival. And you can see that on your left hand side there is a biopsy from lung biopsy where you can see quite diffuse uh, small intraseptal and medium-sized artery thrombosis which is again a patho almost pathophysiomonic um, um, hallmark of the COVID-19 pneumonitis, particularly in the early stages with preserved compliance. And this is also confirmed clinically. This is the study by Giacomo Grassell in the Lancet Respiratory. And you can see that one of the main factors associated with outcome or worse outcome, I should say in this case, is the higher D-dimers. So it's not so much of other characteristics, but patients with more severe immunothrombosis have a worse, worse outcome. And this is important because that can translate into large vessel uh, clots. So this is a CT scan of a large pulmonary embolus on the right uh, pulmonary artery. And you can see this is very common. Up to one in three of these patients have got large pulmonary emboli. But also you've got small pulmonary emboli and also diffuse uh, reduction in uh, perfusion, this is our own data, in the absence of any visible thrombus. So that's quite important because this is a study, very recent study, where they looked with an iodine map, they looked at perfusion within the lung. And what you can see is two things. One is that in the areas of relatively healthy lung, there is a severe hypoperfusion. So these are lungs that are normally ventilated, but not perfused. So associated with large dead space ventilation. But also what you can see is that around the ground glass, so the areas that are not ventilated as well, there is an increased perfusion. And you can see here that the severe hypoperfusion of the healthy lung is associated with that hazard ratio, which is almost 12 times greater in terms of ICU admission and in terms also of mechanical ventilation with a hazard ratio of almost eight. So that's quite an important characteristic. And this is also translated into the, um, into the um, more microscopic, so histological characteristics of these lungs. So this is a quite interesting study published in the New England Journal, where you can see two things. One is they've compared the COVID-19, patients who died of COVID-19 versus the ones who um, died from ARDS from H1N1. And the two most important characteristics are one, that thrombosis are present at a nine times greater prevalence than RDS. So that's the quite important thing to say that is not exclusive, but is much more prevalent. And the second thing, which appears to be very interesting, is the new vessel growth. So there is neoangiogenesis in these lungs, which is almost three times greater than the conventional viral ARDS. And the third thing is that these features increase with time. So as the hospitalization happens, 
as the patients spend time in the intensive care on the wards, these characteristics increase over time rather than remain constant, like is the case in H1 and 1. So again, the new vessel growth and the new vascularization can explain all that increased perfusion in the, vent in the poorly ventilated lung. But this is important. You can see this is a, a table which I've summarized for you some of the earliest studies. You can see a huge variability in mortality from 16% to 88%. And some of this is possibly associated with a huge variability in uh, the type of ventilatory support. You can see there the invasive mechanical ventilation ranges from 21% of patients to 90% of patients. So huge variability, uh, which um, I think part of it is to do with, with availability again, particularly at the early stages when the healthcare system was overwhelmed. Also the pre prevalence of prone positioning and the of ECMO. So the question is, is there a role <clears throat> of mechanical ventilation and what is that role particularly related to the uh, outcome? And so we've heard from both talks from Professor Gattinoni and Chiumello that um, COVID-19 in a way has got atypical characteristics. The atypical characteristics, mainly from symptoms perspective, is that there is a huge dissociation between hypoxemia and breathlessness, hypoxemia and loss of lung volume and therefore compliance, and the response to PEEP as a consequence of that. And this slide has been shown before, but essentially is to show that with the same impairment oxygenation, we can get very different level of, um, of uh, lung volumes from a relatively spared, uh, you can see at the top, to a severely compromised um, compliance with very small volumes and uh, the baby lung concept. And so therefore the hypoxemia we've got from a dysregulated perfusion to microthrombosis, which is part of the same, to a ARDS like and clearly those um, phenomena which are not mutually exclusive uh, are essentially conceptual. They're not binary or stable or mutually exclusive but vary with time and treatment as we've seen before also with the CT scan studies. So those are important considerations. And you can see this is a, a, a very recent study where <clears throat> the authors looked at the LANGSAFE study, the International Point Prevalence Study on ARDS. And what they found is they, and they say essentially, yes, we also find the L phenotype, the low elastins, the, the, uh, and the high compliance, therefore, uh, phenotype but only in 12%, one in 12, one in 10 almost. And I'd like to point out a couple of things. One is the outcome. You can see the H phenotype has got really high uh, mortality rate, about 40%, whereas the L phenotype has got 27%. And this is reflected also in the death in hospital. Now, this is important because I would like to contrast it with the uh, COVID-19 ARDS both in terms of outcome and in terms of prevalence. So this is our own data. Basically you show, you can see that loads of these patients, almost 60% uh, uh, of patients with severe DS can be safely ventilated with extremely lung protective ventilation. And they've got completely, almost completely normal compliance above 40 uh, um, milliliters per centimeters of water. So again, very prevalent at patients with severe PF ratio dysfunction, but with normal compliance and therefore lung volumes. Now, this is another study on the right hand side. They, um, the authors here report that more than 25% of patients have got a preserved lung compliance, despite the fact the average is 28, 28, which would overlap with what you might call classical ARDS. 
And again, on the left hand side, you can see the compliance is greatly increased and statistically so in COVID-19 compared to classical ARDS. Again, uh, confirming the fact that this phenomenon and this phenotype is much more prevalent in uh, COVID-19. Uh, again, look at that peep, about 10 centimeters of water uh, with a narrow range, 8 to 12. Um, and this is a study from uh, Professor Cumello and Professor Gattinone and the first and last author in this paper. Again, where you can see that when patients are matched either for PF uh, uh, as, as well as all the other characteristics between ARDS typical, which we call PF ARDS or ARDS from COVID-19, you can see the difference in lung volume in, uh, in uh, COVID-19. Now, this is from other studies as well. You can see uh, two things. One, that the gas exchange is the same between COVID and non-COVID, but the driving pressure is much lower in COVID, uh, indicating the lung volume is greater. Uh, the compliance is much greater. You can see the p-value there, but also you can see the indices of dead spaces are uh, greater in COVID than non-COVID, indicating exactly what the, uh, we can see from CT scan and biopsies. Essentially, the lung that is normally ventilated is poorly perfused. So there is an increased dead space over there. And we've seen that also in our own data, where you can see that all the patients, whichever way you look at, ventilate, uh, at uh, dead space, regardless of the lung compliance and regardless of the PF ratio, the dead space fraction is increased in these patients. And again, this is a, again another study where they say that um, COVID-19 looks like RDS, but I would add, does it? Because if you look at this uh, data, more than 50% of the patients have got PF ratio that is above what you might call ARDS range. They've got a compliance that is above 40 milliliters per centimeter of water, but yet the PEEP values are very elevated and the plateau pressure very high, much higher than what you would expect given the severity of the disease. So there might be a concept that the way we set PEEP only based on oxygenation and not on lung compliance might affect some of the outcome and might affect some of the choices that we make at the bedside. Again, this is the lung safe. You can see one thing, that the probability of dying decreases with increase in lung compliance. So this is a normal ARDS. But that's not the case in COVID-19. You can see again, going back with the Grasselli paper, they found no difference in survival between high compliance and low compliance. It's only when inflammation goes into the mix is that where we find the, the, the differences. So again, although it looks similar, it's not similar. And this is important because it comes to the last bit of the talk, which is, lung uh, mechanical ventilation. And I see mechanical ventilation like a recipe. You've got various ingredients. These ingredients are the ones we know about, but also the way we mix this ingredient makes a difference between a perfectly shaped cake and a complete disaster. So I think we need to be able to mix those ingredients carefully and knowledgeably. So let's start with one ingredient, which is the tidal volume. Now, we know from uh, now, many years ago, this is from uh, uh, Pierpaolo Terragni's paper, but basically they looked at patients treated with the recipe of lung protective ventilation, six mils per kilo, plateau pressure less than 20 or 30. But you can see that some of these patients, the patients with a bigger lung were protected, and the ones who had a more collapsed or consolidated lung were not protected. You can see the one in um, red, which are area of over distension and over inflation. And if you take that uh, associated with the heterogeneity of the lung, you call that ventilator induced lung injury. And this is one point because 
If we think, you can see uh, Professor Gattinoni has shown a similar slide where he put uh, the aerated lung versus the compliance. And you can see that aerated lung, uh, as the lung volume goes up, clearly the compliance is higher. And as the lung volume goes down, the compliance diminishes. Now, if we get a fixed tidal volume, in this case, for example, 420 milliliters of, of tidal volume for a predicted body weight of 70 kilo, so let's say six mils per kilo of ideal body weight, the compliance will have a, an important role because if the compliance is preserved and we've got tidal volumes of six, we have hypoventilation and we've got reabsorption at electrices and therefore worsening oxygenation and gas exchange. At the same time, if the compliance is low and therefore the lung volumes are low, the same tidal volume will produce excessive strain and lung injury. So the one recipe will not apply to all the possible cakes, so to speak, all the possible patients. So the idea of scaling tidal volume to predicted body weight is not a, a use, well, is a useful starting point, but it's not ideal for every patient. And we know that because there are plenty of studies comparing low tidal volume and traditional tidal volume, you can see over there, that they've shown no difference in outcome between the two modalities. And clearly what is missing there is the ability to adapt the tidal volume to the lung volume. And so one way of doing it is, would be ideal is that the tidal volume should be sized to the lung volume. And so one way of doing that, as we know, the relationship between compliance and FRC, and if we take the idea of strain as a uh, tidal volume divided by FRC, and we can uh, substitute FRC with compliance. We all know the formula of compliance. So with very simple mathematics, we can find out that the uh, driving pressure could be a substitute for strain. And, if, and indeed, when we look at this paper in um, 2015, the only thing that made a difference in terms of outcome was not the tidal volume above or below seven, was not the plateau pressure above or below 30, but was the driving pressure. And it's because the driving pressure will give us an idea of how well the tidal volume is sized compared to the lung volume. And this is again from the same paper from Professor Cumel and Gattinoni's, where you can see that patients with ARDS from COVID-19, they've got more preserved lung volume, they've got greater lung volume, and therefore they can potentially accommodate in the early stages of their disease, a greater, more, a more liberal uh, tidal volume to start with. And I'll come back to that at the end of the talk. Again, going back to uh, the lung safe study, you can see again 12%, but what you can see is that the doctors here have applied the same, the same rationale, even without wanting to. You see here, the tidal volume in the L phenotype here is 8.5 milliliters plus or minus 2.2. And the driving pressure is only 7.6 uh, centimeters of water. Now, if you compare it with the H phenotype there on your left hand side, despite the fact that the tidal volume was much lower, 7.5 was still excessive because your, the driving pressure was 17 centimeters of water. So you can see that the just the mils per kilo of ideal body weight will not tell us about lung protection or strain. So that's quite important. And again, you can see here, I've uh, uh, repeat this slide to say that the L phenotype seems to have a lower outcome. Now, PEEP. Um, PEEP is very uh, interesting because you can see here, this is a different study in COVID-19. You can see on your left hand side, the upper quadrant, you can see going from low PEEP to high PEEP, most patients will improve their PF ratio. But uh, some patients 
you can see the ventilatory ratio goes uh, down, but for most of them goes up, indicating increasing dead space with COVID with, with high peak. Respiratory system compliance, more than 50% goes down. Uh, and driving pressure in some patients improves and in some patients deteriorates. So it's not all about gas exchange when we consider PEEP. And again, I've done a little table for you there as a summary. And what you can see that most of the studies that have considered ventilation in COVID-19 use a driving pressure that is well below the 17 centimeters of water that you've seen in the lung safe is well below the 15 centimeters of water, which is considered a safe in ARDS, indicating that they overall their compliance is relatively more preserved despite the fact the PF ratio is in the category of moderate or severe ARDS. Now, if you look at the bottom row here, this is the index of recruitability. This is the recruitability to inflation ratio. The greater the ratio, the greater the recruitability. But what you can see, there's a huge variation from completely unrecruitable to very highly recruitable. And now this is important because now you can see this is in one study where you can see that um, one third, 36% of these patients were poorly recruitable based on the uh, recruitment to inflation ratio maneuver and 64% were recruitable. Now, one of the things that you can see at the bottom, that clearly the delay from symptoms to ITU or delay from symptoms to intubation may play a role. This was not statistically significant, I, I need to disclose, but essentially it's an interesting uh, point, I thought. The ones that are highly recruitable uh, are early in the intubation or early in the symptoms, whereas as you go on over time, then the lung fibrosis and other phenomena that we'll show later on may be preponderant mechanism and therefore poorly sensitive to recruitment maneuvers. Uh, this is just one reason why they might be the case. So this is a histological pattern of some of the ARDS, COVID-related ARDS. And you can see there is no, long, no lung collapse later on, but there is fibrosis, there is a fibrinous organizing pneumonia, there is alveolar fibrin, and therefore a fibrin-rich pneumonitis, which is not sensitive to PEEP, will not be a PEEP-responsive disease. So when we use uh, a PEEP table, um, which is based on FIO2, to dictate the, 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 the PEEP selection, well, it depends which one we use, we might end up using an excessive amount of PEEP, which not only might not be beneficial, but might be deleterious, as always been <coughs> discussed in previous talks. So then when we look at putting all this element together in the mechanical power, and we look at the equation for that, what you can see is that this is one case where there is a low PEEP, there is a lowish plateau, 25, now, if you take into consideration the respiratory rate of 20 and 500 milliliters of tidal volume with a delta pressure of 14, we've got a mechanical power of 17.6 uh, joules per minute. However, if we uh, chase um, the delta pressure or indeed the oxygenation with much higher PEEP, even if the, the delta pressure apparently is decreased, what we find is that the mechanical power will increase. And as a consequence, we go for a more lung protective to a less lung protective ventilation. So that's quite important. Let alone the risk of barotrauma in the second wave of COVID, we've seen a significant increase of patients present with barotrauma. I'm not clear myself exactly what's the cause, whether it's the the effort in breathing, whether it's the early use of steroids, whether it's a late presentation or just different phenotype, I'm not very sure, but there's something to be aware of uh, apart from the effect on the hemodynamics. So this is my last slide.
And this is to say that when we consider ventilation, we need to think about the status of the patient, the timing and the uh, recruitability as well as the lung mechanics. So if you go on your left hand side, you can see that a patient may present initially with hypoxemia, but low, uh, normally sort of a preserved lung volumes, therefore a low level of edema. And by definition, there is low substrate for recruitability. So in that case, if you look at the top, the PEEP required is low, but we can be more liberal in terms of tidal volume within reason, just because the lung volume can accommodate slightly larger tidal volume. But as we move time-wise and in terms of disease severity on the right-hand side, we can see that the edema might be preponderant in the intermediate stages, and, but the lung volumes are reduced. So the tidal volume will need to be reduced because obviously the, the delta pressure will increase and the strain might increase, but the patient might be recruitable. And that's the, when the variation in the studies takes place uh, because all are different stages. In that case, a higher PEEP might be required. And when we move to the end stages of lung or more advanced disease, then the lung volume is still reduced, but this time are reduced not because so much of edema, but because of organizing pneumonia, because of fibrosis or fibrin-rich deposits, which are not recruitable. So in that case, PEEP has no value, uh, if not to deteriorate hemodynamics and barotrauma. So the PEEP might need to be dropped again, but this time the tidal volumes need to be reduced and maintained low because the lung volumes are reduced. And in between these things, obviously prone position is very important up to a certain point where it might not have any more effect in the later stages. And pharmacological treatment is important. Clearly look at dead space and markers of immunothrombosis and think about heparinization. Think about steroids and obviously anti-inflammatories. And we, some of the patients might have a more vasocentric disease, uh, which might be responsive to some vasodil pulmonary vasodilators. And uh, so we'll take that into consideration and two things I'm going to end up with saying is think about PF ratio, obviously, but, uh, which is important, but think about lung mechanics and think about how the recipe, which is mechanical ventilation, will need to be uh, tailored to the mechanics to make sure that not only we uh, treat the patients and avoid deterioration, but we avoid harm. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention that late in the evening. Thank you very much. That was really good. Thank you. Um, as before, we have now uh, somehow 10 minutes uh, for any questions from the audience. Um, okay. We have the first one, which is a little bit generic, a little bit open, but what works in management of COVID in terms of mortality? Oh, I think this is a really complicated question, right? <laughs> so what works? So, um, so in terms of mortality is at the moment, there is very little data outside the use of steroids, uh, which clearly we know from the recovery trial that is useful. We've got some um, early reports on some of the immunomodulatory drugs, such as interleukin-1 receptor antagonists or interleukin-6, but it's still very unclear whether or not they will work. There are some randomized control trials that will are expected to report soon. And unfortunately, I know that some of them have been terminated early uh, for uh, harm. Uh, but essentially, at the moment, we know that the immunothrombosis is quite important. So we need to think about the therapies and uh, control worker breathing and treat the lungs as gently as we can and just give the time for the disease to run its course. Uh, 
clearly once they get into the intensive care, things like remdesivir or other uh, um, um, antivirals have got limited efficacy. Most of the game is played for these uh, drugs before the intensive care. Apart from that, I'm not really clear, I'm not really sure what else has been demonstrated. All the rest is my, my own ideas and the one I've shared with you uh, in the last 30 minutes. Okay, thank you. There is one question that is actually coming from two sources, which is what is your experience with the APRV mode in COVID-19? Yes, I mean, it's a very good question. Obviously, we've used the APRV before, um, but in, um, in COVID-19, because of this um, preserved lung volumes from some of the patients, one in four of our patients, one in three of our patients, we've used much lower ventilation pressure. And for some of the patients, we've used APRV for a more advanced, very re more recruitable uh, type of patients. But generally, uh, we have used a more of a conventional ventilation for these kind of patients. Okay. There is another question, which is in the late phase, patients in pressure support ventilation need a great driving pressure. What do you recommend in these cases? I think in these cases it's very difficult because obviously one side, we know that <clears throat> some of these patients have got huge respiratory drive. They have um, high prevalence of delirium, which can contribute to large um, um, in a sort of effort, but also asynchrony or dyssynchrony, which can create a problem in terms of lung injury. I think you need to measure the respiratory drive and you need to measure the effort. And again, in a similar fashion as the non-invasive ventilation, if this is excessive, has to be modulated, has to be reduced, especially when the patient is not ready to be fully awakened and fully liberated from ventilation. I have another question here, which is in your opinion, ventilation should be depending on lung mechanics. In this case, which lung mechanic parameters are important to determine, uh, determine the timing of the disease? Um, yes, thank you for that. I mean, I think there are two things. So uh, one, when the patient is fully sedated and passive, passively ventilated, Clearly lung mechanics, lung volumes like compliance elastins, lung volumes is useful and recruitability either via CT scan or just by using the single breath method that has been described before as a approximation of recruitability might be useful. And later stage when they are, when they are um, more awake, I think uh, things like P01, things like esophageal swings or other methods to measure the spontaneous driving pressure might be helpful. Um, but, um, but yeah, there are difficult decisions at the bedside, particularly when you've got such a huge number of patients that you need to look after, and some of them might not even be within the intensive care. Okay. Um... There is another question here. We still have five minutes plus. To what extent is the mechanical ventilation or can the mechanical ventilation affect neurocognitive uh, functions? Okay, that's an interesting one. So, so I think in COVID-19, there are two ways or maybe three ways to answer that question. I I'll try, we'll see what you think. But one is that um, there is an element of the disease itself that can affect the, new, the cognition. We know, for example, that um, SARS-CoV-2 has a neurotropic effect. It's got in the limbic system. It can be in the other areas of the brain that are associated with cognition, with memory, and with delirium. Uh, the other one associated with the, with the drive. 
now there is, as you know from the literature, there is an interplay between ventilation and hippocampal um, effects and vice versa. So the uh, so ventilation can affect cognition, mainly also by a sedation, but also cognition will affect ventilation. So all the elements of dyssynchrony uh, that we know about. So I can only answer at the moment in very general terms, and I'm sorry if I've disappointed a precise answer, but I, I, I just, I'm looking at, in these three big boxes. Okay. I think for the time being, there are no more questions. Oh, uh, yeah, we have one more, just one more. Can we use conventional winning tools in the ventilator to win COVID patients, for example, NIF or P PO1? Yes. The short Good. answer, the long answer is yes, the lungs are the same, but you need to make sure, in my opinion, to make sure that the disease is really resolved, that the inflammatory markers are coming down, that you've got the disease, the underlying disease under control, because otherwise some of these patients have a second wave of inflammation. And what you think is patient is weaned and ready for extubation, actually a few days later is not. And uh, let's start again with the same problem. Okay. And I think we are going to close with another two questions that I hope they are short. Let's let's go for the first one. How do you assess the lung record ability at the bedside? So it's a very difficult one, but um, one of the methods has been proposed is the one I've tried to um, illustrate, which is one of the um, it's called sort of recruitment infl inf inflation index. It's, uh, it's a proxy uh, measure of recruitability in the absence of CT scan. Uh, I'm quite happy to put a reference or maybe email you a reference and then you can email around, I don't mind. Okay, so um, I have another one. What about the prone position in awake patients? Okay, prone position in awake patients is um, very interesting because I, I get the impression that everyone is doing it and clearly it will, it does affect peer fracia, it will improve oxygenation, but what we have learned is that it's very transient. So the, the peer fracia improves in prone position and then back again in supine position. And there is some data now from international study in Spain, for example, that demonstrate it doesn't really um, affect intubation rate and it does not affect outcome. So it, just we need to make sure that these are interventions that we time uh, uh, to avoid delay in intubation, but sometimes can be useful. For example, you have a patient, you're starting steroids, you're starting heparin, and you want to see whether this treatment will have an effect and improve over time, that will buy you time. The only problem is that when you see a patient is clearly not improving, the respiratory rate is, um, uh, well, the respiratory efforts are elevated that we don't use just the PF ratio as a delaying strategy. Uh, but, um, but yes, it, patient needs to be assessed. Uh, on an individual level. Okay, I'm going to close with this one. This is the last question for now. Is there any place for inhalation heparin for COVID patients? I think it's a very good question. And uh, obviously has been, has been tried in uh, various trials and studies in inflammatory lung disease and inflammatory airway disease. So there have been few case, few studies in ARDS uh, some other studies in asthma, for example. So I don't have direct experience, but we have been thinking about this and we might start a little study looking at that specifically. It's an interesting molecule, heparin, um, very anti-inflammatory, um, very different from the systemic effect. So it could be interesting, but I don't have any direct experience. Looking forward to <laughs> to learn something in the future. Sounds mm -hmm. very interesting. Okay, I think for now, uh, this is it. So thank you very much for your session. Very, very illustrative, very interesting.
Thank you to the three of you gentlemen. That was a really, really nice session. Thank you.